Hello, everyone. I'm Joy Larson Heidley, um, and it's an honor for me to be here tonight and be able to share a little bit of insights into the world of genetic testing and the role of genetic counselors. So I, too, should have a polling question for you. How many new genetic tests enter the market on a daily basis? Okay, you guys guessed pretty well. There's 10 new genetic tests that enter the market on a daily basis. So I'm going to be talking a lot tonight about, um, you know, about how these tests and the, and the complications that, that we're ha experiencing in the community and being able to incorporate all of this into standard care. So I'm realizing all of a sudden that I'm rather short and I'm having a hard time seeing my <laughs> slides over the, the top of the podium. Um, so traditionally when we, think about, um, when we think about inherited cancer risk, we typically talk about that 5 to 10 percent of families have a strong inherited component. But with the addition of um, the moderate penetrant genes into the next generation sequencing panel, what we're learning is that it's actually closer to 25 percent of families that have a hereditary component. So it does become pretty important to identify these families early in hopes to um, heighten surveillance and detect the cancers at a much earlier stage, offer some risk reduction surgeries, and then also be able to offer behavior modification or lifestyle choices. Because genetics is a bit unique, a blood test result in one person can impact the rest of the family as well, so it's important to identify those family members who may also have an inherited risk. Family history to me is the low-hanging fruit and is the core foundation of precision medicine. So the difficulty is in the busy practitioner's um, appointments, there's very limited time to accomplish all the tasks that are asked in that small window. So often family history is either not collected or it is minimally collected. So for these reasons, NSGC had published um, our own family history position statement at the end of October. Um, and there's key differences between information that is collected for um, a triage family history and those that are collected for um, complete risk assessment. So the pedigree diagram that's here actually shows a, the, the amount of information that's required for complete risk assessment, and that's a three to four generation pedigree, as well as information needs to be gathered on all members of the family, not just the people in the family who've been diagnosed with the cancer, because that influences the, the risk assessment models. Um, and again, even though it's 2015, we do need to be taking the families from both sides of the family because we are still under-recognizing inherited risk from the father's side of the family. As a genetic counselor, when I'm talking about risk assessment, really all I'm referring to is, is we're reviewing that pattern of cancers that are in the family to determine the likelihood that there is an inherited risk factor that's contributing to that to what we're seeing. We need to develop a differential um, gene list so that when we're trying to select amongst the panel tests and things that are available, we need to make sure that any test that's selected has all of the genes on the differential. And then select the most appropriate person to do the testing. It may not be the person that's sitting right in front of me. It may be actually a relative instead. The world of genetic testing is under a rapid, rapid um, change, especially in the last 18 months to two years. And it's important that the clinical expertise keep pace with the technology. And as I mentioned with the polling question, there are 10 new tests that are hitting the market on a daily basis. That's a lot for, for, for the average practitioner to try to keep on top of and to sort through. In addition to the increased volume, the kind of information, the complexity of that information is dramatically changed as well. So, I wanted to give you a little bit of background information about the current status for the genetic counseling profession. We're under a period of rapid growth. Um, we've had an 88% increase in the number of board certified genetic counselors in the last nine years, so there are more than 4,000 genetic counselors in the United States. And NSGC has been um, working on proactive efforts to increase our, our genetic counselor workforce, as well as a second pronged approach to maximize the efficiency of the existing workforce in efforts to, see that, to increase the number of patients that can be served. Part of the access issues that, that we've um, all talked about is how do we, get, how do we um, reach the most patients? And traditionally, that service delivery model has been through face-to-face -face consultations. But there's been an increased move towards offering genetic counseling through telephone or telegenetic, which is just a combination of the phone and the computer. And it's really helped to increase access for those patients that are in rural or underserved areas, as well as access for providers that don't have a genetic counselor that works inside their practice. Studies have already shown that there's comparable satisfaction and outcomes regardless of those service delivery models, so it, it does really help um, improve access for those patients. So uh, 
I was asked specifically to talk about um, the implication, the, the outcomes that have come from the adding genetic counseling as part of the testing process. So for this next part, I'm going to be focusing specifically on the role of the genetic counselor. But please understand that we are fo that we are functioning side by side with our physician colleagues as part of that healthcare team. So the role of the genetic counselor, um, we ha the, it, the studies have shown that we've been able to decrease the costs, um, significant costs to the healthcare system by reducing inappropriate testing. And I'll give you some examples in a minute about what I mean by that. Um, it's also from the, from the different skill set that we bring to the table, we're able to identify different risk factors that might ha in a family history that might have been missed by the referring provider. And there's costs that come with, with missing those risk factors as well. So we want to be able to pick up all of the indications and test when appropriate. Um, but I also want to highlight the value of the counseling skills that come to that interaction because um, the, that support and being able to understand how to use that information in the medical care becomes extremely important. So Priority Health a few years ago had published, um, published this slide. So I want to walk you through the history of BRCA1 and 2 testing briefly. So clinical testing became available in 1996. And you can see long about 1999, that's when the data became available to talk about how do I, that we could actually make an impact or make a difference with utilizing the, the gene testing. So some insurance companies began to put the criteria in place at that point as to who would qualify to actually get the test in, testing done. Then comes, when you follow the red line, those are the insurance companies that did not put that um, early filter in place. The purple line is the um, companies that, that did. And you can see their experience when we hit to 2002 when the direct-to-consumer testing process happened and the rapid increase in utilization of BRCA1 and 2 testing. In 2009, Priority Health put a um, requirement in place that required the addition of um, a, a patient to see a genetic counselor prior to the coverage of the test. So what they learned from that is having a policy in place helped reduce some of the inappropriate testing, and it served as a great filter, but in and of itself was not enough to receive the maximal benefit. By having the patient see a board-certified genetic counselor as part of that consultation, we were, they were able to reduce another 25 to 33 percent of, of tests that were deemed inappropriate. So what I mean by that is when, when looking at the test requisitions, it looked like those patients would have met testing criteria for it to have that test covered. But when the full pedigree was drawn and the relatives are placed in the correct location and we're not blending together both sides of the family, that's what I mean by those, some of those um, tests were, were considered inappropriate at that, pe at that point because they no longer met the criteria. The example that was given for 10,000 members that were getting tested, the cost to do that the test would have been in the range of 10 million. Adding the cost of the genetic counseling in was about 2.7 million and it netted a savings of 7.2 million. AREP is a major reference laboratory. Um, from their perspective, they also utilize genetic counselors to put into place a test utilization program. And what they had their genetic counselors do is to review the, the test requisitions that were coming in to ensure from the, from the clinical information that was provided on the requisition that the test that was ordered was actually the test that, was, that met the indication. And when there was questions, they reached out to the, referring, to the ordering clinician to clarify. And what they found is that 26% of the tests that were, that were ordered actually required some sort of revision. Some of those were canceled because it wasn't the correct test. Um, they were canceled um, because they were, testing was ordered was a gene sequence instead of what would have been either a mutation uh, um, a site specific, for example, for a known familial mutation. It might have been more appropriate to be doing large rearrangement based on the gene or a specific panel of, of common mutations rather than, the, so it's the wrong technology. And in 5% of the cases, it was a duplicate test. And for most of the time with the genetic test, we don't need to order the test more than once. So to show you, just to demonstrate that this, is out, that this can happen outside of just BRCA1 and 2 testing, these were the top five conditions that AREP had noted, um, and it's cystic fibrosis, alpha thalassemia, NF, Lynch, and again, this targeted sequencing. And what they put into place um, at AREP was also to, t to um, request the result of the affected relative. And because many of the times what they were finding out is that the, the site-specific test that was actually ordered for the patient was on the wrong gene when they got the result from the, from the affected pa patient. So that negative test result for them really didn't offer the kind of reassurance they were hoping for. So in their pilot phase, um, by putting this process into place, they were able to save $60,000 a month with, with an um, annual um, $720,000 savings was projected. So they have taken that from a pilot and put that into a formal program. Aetna published their experience with BRCA1 and 2 testing last month, um, and the goal of that paper was really to take a look at, with the professional society guidelines in place talking about referral for genetic counseling, what is happening um, in, the, in the community as far as utilization of genetic services um, and, 
and how often are their policyholders getting access to the appropriate testing. And what they found is that the referral for genetic counseling varied pretty widely amongst the, amongst the different MD special, specialties, with oncology and internal medicine ranking rather high, um, but with OB-GYN population in, ranking um, lower in their referral rate. So they had a higher incident, a higher rate of ordering tests for people who did not meet the standard criteria and um, a rapid growth in testing unaffected. But when we think about the patient population, it sort of makes sense. Um, in, an, in, in the OB-GYN population, much more of those women will be um, unaffected and have to rely on family history to meet the criteria. So as a result, in taking a look at all of that, there was about 16% of their, of their um, study population did not meet criteria, which equated to about 600 people. It became a, it's a, it's a critical issue for us to think about um, because when we talk about um, what kinds of outcomes happen from, from this kind of interaction, those patients um, in Aetna's study documented that they had a higher level of understanding, of knowledge, and satisfaction. They had a better, um, a better sense of knowing what to do with that information, were more likely to be compliant with their surveillance on the, on the back end. So those trends are concerning when we, when we talk about the increasing volume of tests and the complexity of tests. But it all comes down to what are the barriers, because we have to understand all of that. All of our providers are doing the best that they can to provide high quality care. And Bellcross published a study last year taking a look at 684 high risk women. So 100% of these women were candidates for genetic counseling and genetic testing. 90% of those women talked to their provider about their family history, but only 20% were referred. What was unique about that particular setting is that there's a genetic counselor that was on site and their services, they're available in network and their services were reimbursable. So those variables aren't um, a contributing factor in this setting. And ultimately what they found, when they went back and did a retrospective chart review just in case the provider did the um, genetic counseling and testing on their own and they did not find any activity in those charts on the, on the other patients. The key barriers to the referral that they identified that it's, it's lack of time to be able to collect and assess a family history and also um, provider knowledge and comfort in genetics. So the key take home message from the study was that availability of the services alone did not, did not um, lead to appropriate access, access and utilization of the services. So under recognition of the families and under referral is, is definitely contributing to the problem. It is a balance, though, for us to identify who's the appropriate patient so that we don't have overutilization and underutilization of, of the technology. Um, there is a couple of studies that I wanted to highlight for you about underutilization and why that was important. Because when it comes to the uptake of risk management strategies for, women, for individuals who have hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, they had a higher likelihood of being consistent and following through on those strategies after meeting with a genetic professional. Um, again, we're trying to encourage the patient to be an active part of those health care decisions so when we're working with their physicians, they can take a part in that and have some ownership in that, in that process. Um, we're also increased genetic counseling led to um, a higher rate of having that same information communicated to the rest of the family. So that term that we tend to use for that is the cascade testing. And what's important about that is for each of the healthcare dollars that are spent, you can increase the impact by that information getting shared with the rest of that family. Um, and again, we talked about the improved compliance. But there's two sides to the policy coin. Um, there were some unintended outcomes that have, that have happened as a result of the policy, and this is where, um, again, I'm take, coming at this from a collaborative approach, trying to solve a problem. Um, depending, on, depending on the policy, what's result, what has happened is that it is there's extra tasks that have resulted that are increasing the amount of time that the genetic counselor has to spend per patient rather than allowing us to see more patients. So we've got more forms that we're needing to fill out for each patient to document my credentials that I'm a board certified counselor. I need to handwrite on the form what my assessment was along with sending my chart notes and my pedigree so we can kind of see um, where that might be taking time. And then, you know, our, the expertise is recognized um, for this process, but that people who are, who are often reviewing the request often don't have the genetics um, background. So we end up with lots of appeals and times with peer-to-peer -peer review. So that's time for both your, the um, staff at the payers as well as for the genetic counselors. When we talk about the service delivery models, it's important for all, of, for all genetic counselors to have those service delivery models to be reimbursed, particularly with the telephone, because we know that that is, is reaching a lot more people. Um, and the, the databases, or at least the, the payer directories, it's, it's useful to create a, um, a provider category specific for genetic counselors, because we're only going to realize the value of this process if the, if the policyholders can find us. 
So establishing policies for the genetic counseling, um, it's, we need to think about them not just the genetic counseling tied to a particular test. There's value in the counseling process as a whole. If somebody has a concern about what their risk is, being able to see them and talk them through why that test is not indicated is equally as valuable as just being tied to a test. Um, and we need to extend coverage for those people who are unaffected as well, because either the, the, um, the appropriate people in the family may not be, may either not be living or they're unwilling or unable to do the testing. So, and the variability of the value of that pre, that pre and post test counseling can be very different depending on the gene that we're talking about. So this is where we can be working together because with the rapid changing in the DNA testing options, um, we know that the current system is not working with 30% of the tests not being, um, not being ordered appropriately. So it is a way for us to, providers are asking for help in being able to incorporate genetics into their routine care as well as working to provide and maintain education. And it, it really is imperative that all of us are working together to do a better job. So there's to help address some of the um, some of the concerns that have been raised, there's a gap. There's a gap in time from the time a provider makes the referral to the time that they see the genetic counselor. It's usually not very long, but there's a lot of questions that can be raised because it's not something most of the patients have have had access to in the past. So NSGC um, to to help fill this gap and to help the patients and the providers and and we invite the payers if it's if you find the tool useful to have developed some um, different infographics to help walk patients through this is what to anticipate during during the consultation what kinds of information to provide and collect ahead of the appointment to get the most out of that appointment. Um, and in addition, there is a video, um, and I've included the YouTube link here if you'd, like to, um, if you'd like to download that. So could you queue up the video for me, please? Have you seen the term genetic counseling in the news lately? Or maybe your physician has referred you to a genetic counselor and you're not sure what's next? You may have questions about genetic counselors. What do genetic counselors do? When should I see a genetic counselor? What happens during an appointment with a genetic counselor? Genetic counselors have specialized education in both medical genetics and counseling. This prepares them to give you the personalized help you need when it comes to your genetic health. Today there are thousands of genetic tests and the number of tests available grows each year. How do you know whether a genetic test is right for you and what the results mean? Using their genetics expertise, a genetic counselor can work with you and your physician to understand your genetic risks, the tests that may be right for you, and what genetic test results may mean for you or your family. With their expertise in counseling, a genetic counselor can also provide emotional support as you make decisions and empower you with information for your overall health care. Genetic counselors can partner with you, your primary physician or specialist, and your entire healthcare team to integrate your genetic information into your overall healthcare or medical treatments. Genetic counselors work in a wide variety of medical specialties. Genetic counselors help and support patients for a variety of reasons or situations. Maria and Tim's son was diagnosed with autism. They want to know if there is a hereditary link in their families and whether any additional children may be at risk of developing autism too. Susan's mother and aunt were both diagnosed with breast cancer at a young age. Her doctor has recommended genetic testing to determine her risk for inherited breast and ovarian cancer. Linda and Joe want to start a family and they have some hereditary conditions in their family history. They would like to meet with a genetic counselor for pre-family planning to determine the level of risk for their children. After you make your appointment, you can start to prepare. Think about questions you have for your genetic counselor. Outline your family's history of health conditions. Note any questions you have about inherited risks. Think about any of your lifestyle factors that might impact your health. At your appointment, you will review your questions, family history, and inherited risks. Your genetic counselor can help you and your physician determine whether any genetic tests may provide additional information identify the best testing options for you, and will help you understand what those test results may or may not tell you. You will also review how the results may be used along with healthcare and support options based on possible results. If you do move forward with genetic testing, your genetic counselor can help you understand what to expect. Many genetic tests are done through a simple blood sample. Once your test results are ready, 
Your genetic counselor will help you interpret the results and what they mean for you and your family. They may discuss follow-up tests that could be ordered based on your results, or you may need to schedule follow-up appointments with your genetic counselor. You may talk about any medical or lifestyle options or family planning. To learn more about how genetic counseling could benefit you and your family, visit findageneticcounselor.com. Some of the biggest questions that we find um, when it comes from our providers is where, how do we find a genetic counselor? So you saw um, there is the NSGC has a website with, with a find a genetic counselor directory and also there's information on the findageneticcounselor.com website that's listed with that video. One of the other common questions that we get is if I have a brand new patient that's diagnosed with a cancer, how quickly can they get in to see a genetic counselor? So can they utilize that test result in the, in the incorporate, in their immediate medical management decisions? And NAPKI at all this summer published a paper that talked about that the, the, the vast majority of genetic counselors indicated they could see a patient for an urgent referral within one to two days. So when we think about increasing beneficiary access to genetic counselors, it's going to be important for payers to have access to a robust network of the genetic counselors, create that smooth enrollment process, help with the credentialing, um, and again, to make sure that those, those um, databases and directories are up to date with, with the genetic counselors or provider category, and be able to streamline that preauthorization process to facilitate the efficiency of the workforce, the genetic counselor workforce, but also more importantly, access for the patient and decrease that anxiety window for them. So I think all of us in the room coming at this conference from a patient perspective, you know, we've, we are each bringing our respective expertise in our professions to the table with a vision for the future and how we can optimize patient care and be able to facilitate the kind of education because we all need to work together to stay on top of how fast things are changing. So we need to also develop that mechanism to help providers identify the, the, the correct patients and get the referrals. So for us, collaboration is going to be key. By working together, we can benefit our patients, the healthcare system, and the population. And I think these issues highlight the opportunity for the, the payer community as well as NSGC to collaborate on some of these different educational initiatives and by all means enhance the team approach for providing these services. Thank you. So I have um, a couple of minutes that I could take questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. No? All right. Well, I will be around this evening. I'm happy to chat. Thank you.